So let's talk about the Sony A6000's menu system. I'm gonna go step by step and tell you what each function does. Okay, so image size is going to select the size of the still images that you want. We've got large at 24 megapixels, medium at 12 megapixels, small at six megapixels. However, if you're unsure of which to select, you probably just want to stick with the large, so therefore you have more options later. You can't really improve quality after taking a picture, though you can downgrade, and you can even do that in a batch function. Next, we have aspect ratio, and slow, and this selects the aspect ratio for your still images. So we got uh, three to two, which is standard, you know, old schoolio television style, and then we have the 16 by nine widescreen version. Next, we have quality. And so we have uh, multiple uh, options here. We've got raw, raw plus a JPEG, fine, and standard. Raw plus a JPEG is going to require the most space, raw a little less, fine much less, and standard even less. And then we have a an option for panorama, but we need to select the mode dial to panorama. Obviously, you can read that this creates a panoramic image while you move the camera left or right or up or down at a fixed speed, and you just follow the directions. You can sweep from left to right, right to left, down to up, or up to down. Here you're gonna select your codec that you want to use to compress your video. And so with the new update, you're able to use, I believe this is proprietary, Sony's proprietary XAVC-S. This has a bit of an advantage over AVC-HD and definite advantages over MP4. The XAVC-S allows you to do uh, 50 megabits a second, and there's just a, a hint better quality, though the file size is double. With the XAVC, you'll be required to use a 64 gigabyte memory card or higher. A 32 gigabyte will not cut it and you will get an error message. And this is the error message you'll get. This memory card does not support recording of the XAVCS movie file format. Change the file format or change the memory card. Refer to the instructions manual for details. And this is a message you will get if you don't have the right memory card in there. And pretty much it just needs to be 64 gigabytes or larger. And the file trees are all different depending on which codec you use. Meaning when you remove your memory card and place it into your computer or attach your camera to the computer, you will be searching through a different series of folders depending on which codec you used. I believe all your pictures will be in this tree, which is basically the root and then in the DCIM folder and then in a, in a separate folder. And you can create new folders in camera for organizational purposes uh, and you can create different naming conventions. We'll see that later. Using the XAVC codec, your videos will be placed in, in the root of the memory card. Enter the private folder, M4 root, and then the clip folder. And that's where you should find your videos. And you can see just a few seconds at uh, nearly 100 megabytes. This is quite a large file size. And that's probably one of the reasons why they require a 64 gigabyte memory card or higher. Using the AVCHD file format, so you'll go to your memory card, private, AVCHD, BDMV, and then in your stream folder, you'll find a .mts file or files, and those are your AVCHD file format files. And with the AVCHD file format, you're able to record with these settings, 60 frames a second at 28 megabytes bitrate, and you can also do 60i or 24p. Now off the top of my head, I don't, this is again the same with the pictures. I would just want to record at the highest possible quality and the highest frames per second. And if I needed to adjust that, I can do that in post, unless I know for certain that the end result needs needs to be at 24p or something like that. But still, the latitude that I would get by keeping as much quality as possible, it just gives me more options and I can just adjust that later. And obviously you have to take into account rendering and things of that nature. But at the default, get just a big memory card and just record at the highest rate. Now, if you're gonna record for long periods of time, camera heat issues may be something to worry about. Size of your video card, you may push those limits using the MP4 file format. Here are the quality settings you can expect. So 1440 at 12 megabits a second. I mean, so this is generally something maybe you want to stay away from. I mean, if you're looking to get the highest quality possible, although this may prove advantageous in some applications and you can expect to find the files in this folder tree. It should be found in the, you'll go to your memory card, MP root, and then there should be a folder in there that has your MP4 file. And be aware that this is a new video file format for the A6000 through an 
an update. This camera was, uh, I received it as a uh, firmware 2.0, I believe. And then there was a 3.1 update. And that 3.1 update did a bunch of things plus this XAVC file format option. If you wanna get into the guts of the XAVC standard, I mean, there's a Sony Professional Solutions America uh, channel, and you, or you could just Google XAVC advanced video coding technology and they're going to wrap you through some really intricate ins and outs of the of the codec. So drive mode basically sets how you will be taking your pictures. You've got the single shot. You've got the high burst, that 11 frames a second. You can adjust that to mid or low. And so let's see how the high burst 11 frames a second sounds. And then let's go ahead and check out uh, medium. Let's go ahead and check out low continuous shooting. This is a self timer mode. You can choose to have the camera shoot a single picture after 10 seconds or two seconds. And let's go ahead and see what that looks like. Okay, and this is self timer mode continuous shooting and shoots uh, images continuously after 10 seconds. And you can select how many images it does shoot. And so let's go ahead and see what that looks like. Oh yeah, I'm, and my pants that I'm gonna wear tomorrow, they're in the wash right now. And if you notice right there, I'm able to stop the timer by pressing the shutter again. Let's try that again. Oh yeah, and, and the pants that I'm so I just tomorrow, stopped the shutter by pressing right it a second time. So, um, uh, yeah, I'm and then I did it again. And so that was for 10 seconds with a uh, three shot burst. And this is continuous bracketing. So this is gonna shoot images while holding down the shutter button, each with different degrees of brightness. And so this is helpful when you're doing HDR um, or just to have these different exposures. And you're also able to select the different exposure values. So how much brighter do you want it or darker? And so this is gonna shoot a specified number of images instead of just like a rapid fire machine gun. This this is going to shoot a specified number of images one by one, each with different degrees of brightness. And this is going to be bracketed white balancing, uh, tone and color filter. That's not really necessary. Uh, you can do all this post process. Uh, there may be some value to it. I don't see it. Uh, but you basically shoot a total of three images, each with different color tones, according to the selected settings for white balance, color temperature and color filter. And this is bracketing uh, using the D range optimizer, D range optimizer. Optimizing. It shoots a total of three images, each at a different degree of D range optimizer. So you can have a low setting or a high setting and records a series of three images with either small changes in the D range optimizer value or large changes in the D range optimizer value. So here we've got the flash modes. Uh, not to be confused with flash mobs or flip mode squads. And we've got the no flash, so the flash will not operate. We've got the auto flash, which it will just select when it's appropriate to use. So it'll, it'll like in a dark area, it's probably going to use the flash or perhaps uh, when shooting towards bright light to illuminate your subject, it might choose to use the flash at that point. This is the fill flash. So the flash works every time you trigger the shutter. This is a slow sync. The flash works every time you trigger the shutter. Slow sync shooting allows you to shoot a clear image of both the subject and the background by slowing the shutter speed. This is slow sync and slow sync shooting allows you to shoot a clear image of both the subject and the background by slowing the shutter speed. This is the Rear sync, uh, the flash works right before the exposure is completed every time you trigger the shutter. Rear sync shooting allows you to shoot a natural image of the trail of a moving subject, such as a moving car or walking person. And this is a wireless flash. The shading effect provides a more 3D appearance to a subject uh, than when using an attached flash. This mode is effective when you attach a remote control compatible external flash. You have to buy this separately and, and shoot with a wireless flash also sold separately. Uh, placed away from the object. So this is basically uh, just triggers a flash that's not connected to the camera uh, to give you some creative lighting options. And yes, if you don't want to mess with anything, definitely go Sony. Um, if you want to risk some things and, and give it a shot, um, you can get instructions out there, but there's also some warnings out there um, regarding uh, the voiding the warranty and, and 
various voltages causing problems with the hot shoe and and other things like that. So, I mean, maybe just try to find yourself the best deal on a flash so you don't have to mess with stuff. I mean, if you're if you're in the DIY mode, then go do the DIY thing. If you want to shoot pictures and video, then, I mean, pictures in this case, but, but they've got some flashes that actually have a video light. I doubt it is very pleasing, but it could help in run and gun situations. It would look very like ghost hunter-ish, but you know, and I bet the flash is actually bigger than the camera itself. So, so a flash compensation adjusts the amount of flashlight in a range of negative three units exposure value to plus three units of exposure value. So you can also do this by leaving the shutter open longer, but then you get different effects. So if you want to boost the amount of light reaching the sensor from the flash, I mean, you can do it this way or decrease. So flash compensation changes the amount of flash light only and exposure compensation changes the amount of flash light along with the change of the shutter speed and the aperture. So if your subject is out of range, like distance wise, boosting that flash may not help you. If they're out of range, you may not see the effect. Um, also, if your subject is too close and then you're trying to decrease the amount of flash, amount of photons from the flash, you may not see that effect either. It may not be visible because the subject is just too close. So if you've got them at, uh, basically at a medium distance, then you should be able to see the differences in bumping it up or bumping it down. So it goes as low as negative three units and, and up three units. And you can see I'm using the dial. There's red eye reduction. So here's here's the focusing mode. So we've got a single shot autofocus. So this locks the focus when the focus adjustment is achieved. Use single shot autofocus when the subject is stationary. And then we've got just below that. We've got uh, automatic autofocus. So this switches between single shot autofocus and continuous autofocus. According to the movement of the subject. When the shutter button is pressed halfway down. The camera's going to lock focus. When it determines the subject is stationary or continues to focus while the camera subject is in motion. During continuous shooting, the camera automatically shoots with continuous autofocus starting from the second shot. And I believe the reason you're not seeing it here is because my lens doesn't support that. This is basically a macro lens. And this is continuous autofocus, and this is what I generally use for most videos when I just don't want to be concerned about focusing. And this is why this camera is so beautiful. Is because this is, I believe, one of the first cameras to do the autofocusing. So perfectly, so quick. Uh, to where you could do videos, even take even taking pictures for sure, but I'm more in the in the world of videos. Um, there's no noises. There's no gears grinding. It pretty much hits the focus almost automatically given enough light. It doesn't like go past and then come back and then go past. I mean, like uh, my Canon did. Um, there's T5i. So, so this is a continuous autofocus. So it continues to focus while the shutter button is held halfway down. Use this when the subject is in motion. And this is for pictures and, and for video. I mean, it's going to constantly focus throughout the uh, entire time, depending on how you set your focus behavior. This allows you to use a combination of manual focus and autofocus. And then this allows uh, for manual focusing. And here we've got your focusing area. So going from top to bottom, we've got uh, wide zone center, and then a flexible spot from small, medium or large. And so uh, this wide one uh, focuses uh, automatically on a subject within all ranges of the image. Uh, one or more green frames are displayed around the area that is in fact in focus. And then we have a uh, zone focusing mode. So you select the zone on the monitor on which to focus. You can choose among nine zones. The, the camera focuses on a subject in the chosen zone. So there are your nine zones and you can adjust those using the directional pad. And then we've got your center focusing option and it focuses automatically on a subject in the center of an image. And then we've got your flexible spot. So this lets you move the autofocus range frame to a desired point on the screen and focus on a very small subject within a narrow area. So this gives you a lot of control. And so I generally like to use kind of this medium kind of all the time. And I just place the focusing spot on a particular subject and then I can frame it up and then I can take the shot. Here's just the breakdown. We've got your, your wide, your zone, your center, and your flexible spot. So you can see these green dots automatically pop up. There's your zone. This automatically selects a central spot. And then this gives you a, a range of small, medium, and large. And then we can see that here. So there's your medium. We can kind of move it around to what we want to focus it on. There we go. The green uh, shows that it's actually focused because I'm halfway depressing on the shutter. And then we've got a larger focusing area there. Uh, and then we've got the small one. And this works. Uh, I had some issues with it being a little finicky, but you know, there's there's definitely places where this is quite valuable. So this is the autofocus illuminator. 
So it supplies fill light to focus more easily on a subject in dark surroundings. The red autofocus illuminator allows the camera to focus easily when the shutter button is pressed halfway until the focus is locked. Again, distance of subject does play a part here. So focus is going to only be achieved as long as the light can reach the subject or something to focus on. And Sony decided to throw in a little word of caution saying that the autofocus illuminator emits a very bright light. And Sony says that there is no negative health effects, but they suggest you do not look into the autofocus illuminator at close range. And again, it's more of a orangey red light. On the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, this would be considered far safer than, say, the blue to the purple ultraviolet. But still, your eyeballs don't like intense light. So it it's, could be called the autofocus illuminator or the, not the red eye reduction, but the squint eye index. Yeah, I got jokes. So this autofocus drive speed is uh, available in movie mode. So you've got fast, normal, and slow. And obviously, the more active things are, you select fast. And, and then with the slow focus drive, you'll see the autofocus more slowly transition from one autofocus point to the to the next. Which has more of a pleasing effect. So, so if things are focusing in and out too fast um, with the jitter, um, then you might tone down your autofocus drive speed. So the autofocus track duration is also available available only in movie mode. And you can set the duration of the autofocus tracking in movie mode by going through those steps. So for the autofocus track duration, we've got um, high and normal. And so high sets the autofocus track duration to high. This mode is useful when recording movies when the subject is moving quickly. And normal, the default setting, sets the autofocus track duration to normal. This mode is useful when you want to keep the focus on a certain subject when there are some obstacles in front of the subject or in crowded places. So exposure compensation allowing you to make the image brighter or darker. Almost always I set it to just automatic. And so we can see the exposure compensation when we increase it and when we decrease it. So if you got your camera locked off and your subject isn't being ex exposed properly and you don't want to change how your camera's positioned or try to affect the lighting in any way, um, you could adjust the exposure value. So say there's a, a bright sky and you're shooting up on a face, um, you could increase the exposure to brighten up this dark face. Um, but remember, as you're moving your your camera around and you change it you're you're going to be locked into that exposure value so it's something that i would generally uh, not use most of the time but it's a good idea to know that it's there an exposure step just allows you to change the amount of change in exposure value per click or per adjustment so you've got 0.3 or 0.5 exposure values so this is the iso setting and so the higher we go with this iso number the grainier our picture will be and the lower we go the lowest is 100 the more crisp and clean our image will be with the least amount of grain, but it all depends on your various lighting conditions and what you're trying to capture as to what ISO you will be using. When in doubt, leave it on auto. So say if you were capturing the stars at night and you had an ISO setting of 100, your camera would stay on for a very long time so the shutter would be open. And at night, not, that's not a big issue, especially when you're tripoded off because you're not going to get the blurring, although the world and the globe does rotate. So if you are taking pictures of stars and you leave the shutter open long enough, you'll get streaking and maybe that's what you want. So if you're doing a sports game and you've got an ISO setting of 100 in like a, a basketball gym and it's kind of dark, uh, you may get some blurring. And you may want that, but if you're holding it in your hand, you definitely don't want that because your entire image will be blurred. If it's tripoded off, then maybe only the players or the ball will be blurred. And so you can play around with that. But if you leave it on auto, the camera is going to figure it out and give you a, a good image. Maybe not a creative image, but a good image. So sensitivity to light is expressed by this ISO number. So the larger the number, the higher the sensitivity. So if you take this to its max of something like 25,000, uh, uh, that's going to be a really, really grainy image. So basically with fast moving objects, you kind of want to lean towards the higher, but with slow moving or not moving at all, you want to go lower. But again, auto is going to serve you very well. So if blurring is an issue, maybe increasing your ISO number would help in that respect. So you can definitely play around with the multi-frame noise reduction, see how that works for you, see where you can apply that. So the metering mode is going to set which part of the screen to measure to determine exposure exposure value. So by selecting multi, this measures the light on each area after dividing the total area into multiple areas and determines the proper exposure of the entire screen. And this is also termed multi
type pattern metering. This is center metering, so this measures the average brightness of the entire screen while emphasizing the central area of the screen. And this is spot, and this measures only the center of the screen. Now, this function is useful when the subject is backlit or when there's a strong contrast between the subject and the background. So maybe you'll use this instead of adjusting your exposure value in that scenario that I had suggested where you've got a bright light behind a person or you know a contrasty situation where the auto exposure is failing. Um, you can mess around with changing the metering, but it depends on how you've got your subject framed up. So this gives you uh, some more control. And with this particular adjustment, you wouldn't necessarily have to crank back down your exposure value as you might with my previous suggestion. I've been happy just keeping my camera set to the multi setting. And then we've got white balance, which we can do this in post process, but it does take a hit on the rendering aspect. So if you can get it right in the camera, you're going to be way happier uh, than if you have to go render a new white balance. I generally leave this on auto white balance, but sometimes if you have two different lights, um, it could cause uh, some weirdness with your image. And then, then you could start fiddling with this. Um, and if you actually select one of these or a custom one, it just gives you more control and it, it takes it out of the camera's hands to be making adjustments. Uh, that's kind of messing with your final product. So, I mean, when you're running and gunning, use the auto white balance, but when you're going to sit down and have a dedicated project, I, I would suggest that you just set up an appropriate white balance. And when you make that a habit, uh, it just becomes easy. And this is setting up a custom white balance. So you'd want to, under the particular lighting conditions, you'd want to find something that was truly white um, or or gray. It depends on how you want to mess with your camera's white balance. But, but traditionally, you would just use something that's white and then it would take that white data and then adjust the tone accordingly. So we've got the D range optimizer and auto HDR high dynamic range option here. So this is the D range optimizer. So by dividing the image into small areas, is the product, the camera analyzes the contrast of light and shadow between the subject and the background and creates an image with the optimal brightness and gradation. And so uh, I, I should actually have this set to auto. And so this corrects the brightness automatically. That's just for my run and gun scenario. So here it corrects the brightness automatically and changing the levels optimizes the gradation of recorded image for each divided area. Select the optimization from level one weak to level five strong. So high dynamic range, uh, it widens the range so that you can record from bright parts to dark parts with correct brightness. So one image with proper exposure and one overlaid image are recorded. So HDR auto corrects the exposure difference automatically. And when you select these, uh, basically it'll take one picture at a zero, one picture at a negative three, and one picture at a positive three exposure value. And then it will compile that singular image. And then you'll have a very high dynamic range. And so we can take this to more of an extreme and it goes all the way up to six. So you could go negative six to positive six. So you'd have a, a regular image, a very dark image, and a very bright image, and then it would squish that together, um, preserving the value from each image. Now this camera is very fast and can take those pictures very fast, but even if you're holding it in bright sunlight, you may get a minute change in position. And so then when it goes to combine those three images, your HDR image is going to look a little off. So it's recommended you do this on a tripod or with the camera on a stable surface. So even with the camera on a tripod or a stable surface, if you've got wind blowing through trees, hey, it could look kind of cool with the HDR image and the three combined. Uh, right. So the trunks are going to be very high dynamic range. There's going to be high dynamic range everywhere, except for anything that's moving is going to look a little funky. And that may be what you want or maybe what you don't want. So me being that I do almost everything in post, I, I just don't see that this would ever be something that I'd want um, because I might accidentally leave the camera in one of these creative stylings. Um, so this is basically doing like a post process on the image. Um, so we've got a standard, we've got a vivid where we see a lot of saturation. We've got a neutral where the uh, saturation and sharpness are lowered. And, and the neutral is actually what you'd want um, if you were going to take that JPEG. I mean, if you're really going to tweak it, you, you keep the raw and the JPEG. Um, but you'd really want the neutral styling because I believe that'll give you a lot more uh, latitude to work with in the computer itself. But if you're just going to run and gun and shoot pictures and you don't have a future intent on trying to make it at a perfect image in your computer, 
computer, then probably standard is probably going to be what you want. If you take every single picture into your computer and you post process, then neutral might be what you want. If you have a very dedicated project where you're going to take it into the computer, then neutral is going to be what you want, if not raw. The picture effect is kind of the same thing that I stated before. Let's not get goofy. <laughs> let's let's keep it off. Um, but but if you like to play around with some images inside the camera and you don't want to take it to a computer and then do all those steps, um, then heck, I mean, why not? Go ahead, throw a picture effect on. Remember to turn it off though, for sure. Um, we've got um, we got the the toy camera it creates a soft image with shaded corners and reduces sharpness. Uh, we've got the pop color creates a, a vivid look by emphasizing colors and tones. Um, we've got posturization uh, creates a high contrast abstract look but by heavily emphasizing primary colors or in black and white. We've got kind of a retro photo. We got a soft high key, partial color, high contrast mono and a soft focus, watercolor, the whole, we got the works. So, I mean, this is like your Instagram filters, but I mean, it's just not as easy to apply and then undo it. So, so you want to capture the raw, the, the JPEG or the raw, you know, just something that you can work with. So the highest amount of information, and then you can tweak it, but you can certainly play around with all of that stuff. So I don't believe I can use this zoom function on this particular lens, um, or, or it's the setting that I'm in, but, but basically this is going to go past your optical zoom and it's going to go into your digital zoom. Again, it's something I don't suggest suggest, but sometimes it's kind of cool to have so you don't have to do it later if that's what you want. Uh, you can always play it back on your camera and then zoom it in from that point, or you can zoom it in um, from anywhere. So um, I, I would definitely recommend not using a digital zoom because that's just artificially expanding those pixels um, and it's not optically doing it with a lens. So it's going to start to look pixelated is what I'm saying. And focus magnifier just enlarges the image before shooting so that you can check the focus in detail. So that's something that you could definitely play around with. Maybe it'll be helpful. I don't use it uh, because of the intelligent autofocusing that the camera does itself. Uh, it is something that I was using with the Canon because um, I always had to like zoom in and double check and make sure that it was actually in focus. So actually I've turned this function off, I believe the digital zoom. So I can't accidentally switch it on, I believe. So when you set the shutter speed to one second or longer uh, or long exposure shooting, noise reduction is turned on for the duration of the shutter is open. So with that function turned on, the grainy noise typical of a long exposure is reduced. So the noise is reduced on long exposures. So this is high ISO noise reduction. So when shooting with high ISO sensitivity, the product reduces noise that becomes more noticeable when the product sensitivity is high. A message may be displayed during the noise reduction processing. You cannot shoot another image until the message disappears. So you got uh, your normal level activates high ISO noise reduction normally. Uh, the low uh, activates high ISO noise reduction moderately. Select this to prioritize the timing of shooting and off just does not activate the high ISO noise reduction at all. A lock on autofocus. So th this sets up the tracking function to continue. This sets up the tracking function to continue focusing on the subject. Okay, so off does not track a subject to be focused on. On tracks a subject to be focused on. And this one, uh, on start with shutter, tracks a subject to be focused on when the shutter button is pressed halfway. So this is basically what it says it is. It uh, detects the faces of your subjects and adjusts the focus, exposure, flash, settings, and performs image processing automatically. So if you'd like to do group photos or, you know, pictures of people, and it's the same type of person every time, then this is great. Um, so with it off, it does not use the face detection function. With it on, it detects the registered face with high priority using the face registration. Um, with it on here, it detects a face without giving higher priority to the registered face. And then uh, this one, the smile shutter, uh, automatically detects and shoots a smile. And then in order to use any of the registered faces, you need to functions in order to use any of the registered faces functions, you need to register a face. And so it's not, and a total of eight faces of your subjects can be detected. And the soft skin effect is basically just that. It just makes the skin look more smooth. I have not used it. So I guess maybe if you start to get a little bit older, then you can automatically throw in a glow, a low, mid or high. And we've got auto object framing. So I probably should turn this off, but this is used uh, as off or auto. 
and the camera detects and shoots faces, macro shooting subjects or subjects that are tracked by the lock-on autofocus. The product automatically trims the image into an appropriate composition and then saves it. Both the original and the trimmed images are saved. The trimmed image is recorded in the same size as the original image size. So with off it, it doesn't trim the image and then with auto it automatically trims images into an appropriate composition. And so scene selection is going to allow you to shoot with preset settings according to the scene. So your portrait, your sports action, your macro, your landscape, your sunset, your night scene, your handheld, twilight, your night portrait, your anti-motion blur, you got your portrait, your sports action, your macro, your landscape, your sunset. Uh, and with the dial on the movie setting, um, it allows you to switch from uh, in, in movie mode, the program auto, the aperture priority, the shutter priority, or the manual exposure uh, for the movie mode itself. So you can use steady shot when the name of the lens has OSS in it. Yeah, so right here, so steady shot. So basically it's a function of the lens and not necessarily the camera. So here we're at color space, and this is the way the colors are represented using combinations of numbers or the range of color reproduction is called the color space. You can change the color space depending on the purpose of the image. So the default setting is the sRGB. So this is the standard color space of the digital camera. Use sRGB in normal shooting, such as when you intend to print out the image without any modification. So Adobe RGB, this has a wide range of color reproduction when a large part of the subject is vivid green or red. Uh, so, so when a large part of the subject is vivid green or red, Adobe RGB is effective. The file name of the image uh, will start with uh, an underscore DSC. So auto slow shutters for movies, as you can tell by that icon. So it sets whether or not to adjust the shutter speed automatically when recording movies if the subject is dark. So when you're running and gunning, maybe you want that on. But if you want total control of the environment, you might want to turn that off because you don't want that to be automatically adjusting if, if you were going to be controlling it with your vision. So with it on the shutter speed automatically slows when the recording the shutter speed automatically slows when recording in dark locations or when there's dark imagery you can reduce noise in the movie by using a slow shutter speed when recording in the dark locations when you uh, have it off it does not use the automatic slow shutter function the recorded movie will be darker than when on is selected but you can record movies with smoother motion and less object blur and I think generally speaking, you probably just want to keep audio recording on no matter what, because you can always delete that later uh, if you don't want it, uh, unless there's a, a real reason why you wouldn't want that to be recorded, which I can't think of it other than legal or something. Uh, and wind noise reduction that pertains to the, to the microphone. It's pretty self-explanatory. And then here's a shooting tip list, which is interesting for a camera to have all this information in it. Uh, so... All right, and here's where you can have three separate registers where you can put in all some super custom advanced things, whatever you want, and then you can quickly come back to it when the location or the situation permits. Uh, here's the famous zebra or zebra pattern. So this basically is to indicate a particular brightness level that you've set. So the brightest, basically the brightest part of the image. And so we can see that that zebra pattern here on some of the uh, brighter spots, bright aspects of that image and so it's either that or I'm actually videotaping a zebra so the manual focus assist uh, enlarges the image on the screen automatically to make manual focusing easier and so this is what the Canon has as well and this is the only way to get uh, accurate focusing on that Canon um, but this works in manual focus or direct manual focus shooting so basically the image uh, enlarges uh, so you can get that fine adjustment that you want rather than squinting and, and trying to wonder if on the this screen you're seeing it in, in focus. We get the focus magnification time. So using the manual focus assist, here you're denoting how long that assist should stay on for. So it magnifies the image for two seconds, five seconds, and just until you press the shutter button. And we've got the grid lines here. So this is kind of an assist as well. So it's pretty self-explanatory. This is the rule of thirds grid. And, and these won't be displayed with HDMI out. Let's not forget that. And that's true with the zebra lines as well. Um, so here's the rule of thirds. There's a square grid. There's your diagonal plus a square grid. There's your rule of thirds. Here's your auto review setting. 
and you can do 10 seconds, five seconds, or two seconds, and it just displays the recorded image on the screen right after shooting for the selected duration of time. So take a picture, it stays on for 10, five, two, or you can turn it off, which I think a lot of people like to keep it off if they're in, kind of in a, a high paced environment and they're trying to get a shot here and a shot there and a shot here because you don't want that two seconds and that five seconds to impede your creative flow. Um, you don't want to have to sit there and look at the image as you're trying to frame stuff up. So, I mean, some people just turn it off and then they just fire at will and then they'll review all that stuff later. But, you know, if you're going to take, you know, a group photo, uh, then you can turn it on and you can see if you got a good picture or not. You can always hit the play button if you're ever curious as to what you what your pictures look like. So uh, the display button, you can tell where the information is going to be displayed, whether it's the monitor or the viewfinder. So we've got two things here. We got the peaking level and we got the peaking color. And so the peaking level enhances the outline of in focus ranges using a specific color in manual focus or direct manual focus shooting. This function allows you to confirm the focus visually. So we've got a high, mid, low, and off setting. Again, connecting to an HDMI monitor, this won't be shown. So this is on or off and it uh, displays the exposure setting guide. So live view display basically says whether or not to display the creative style or the picture effect on the live view. And then this sets whether or not to display the focus area that is in focus when focus area is set to wide zone or focus mode is set to continuous autofocus. So having it on displays the focus area that is in focus off does not display the focus area that is in focus the zoom setting determines whether or not to use optical zoom only clear image zoom or digital zoom optical preserving the highest quality and clear image zoom i believe is going to use a digital zoom up to a certain point when the software determines that there wouldn't be degradation and digital zoom well you could pixelate the entire image i believe it's just not optimal so you can always zoom post process um, and you can always just view an image and then zoom in on it if that's what you were using the image for so I just don't feel that there's any real reason to do a digital zoom however like on a smartphone I feel you can get away with digital zoom because you might then quickly just send the picture off to somebody or something like that and you want to zoom in on the area of interest in this setting I just don't see what the use of uh, doing anything digitally in the zoom aspect would do for you. So we've got I start autofocus and that's when we're using the viewfinder. So the autofocusing is initiated and started um, when you press put your eye up to the viewfinder. Now I don't ever like to use the viewfinder because it becomes obnoxious um, because the sensor is way too sensitive and and I find it switching between viewfinder and monitor uh, when I don't appreciate or when I don't feel it would be useful. So I go ahead and turn all that off and I do that with this setting here uh, the viewfinder monitor setting um, yes you can see that it's auto you can see that it's auto now but uh, I, I usually leave this straight on monitor so you can do auto a viewfinder or monitor and I tend to leave it right on monitor so right now it's coming through the viewfinder you can't appreciate that that gave you a chance to see that auto focusing in play that continuous auto focusing now we've got this we've got this release without the lens so um i've got that di disabled you would enable it potentially if you were to use a lens that doesn't have the contacts that the camera would recognize as a lens being attached so they sony threw out an example of an astronomical lens so if you put it on some sort of telescope or something like that to where there wasn't contacts made so you're doing some tricky stuff and the camera doesn't know that there's a lens on there or maybe you used some really old lenses or used an adapter and then the the camera is not firing i mean you maybe you want to turn that on and release without the lens and then you would have to set everything up manually, obviously, because you're not going to get any of that um, light sensitivity information. Then we've got autofocus with shutter, and that sets whether to perform autofocus when the shutter button is half pressed. So this is useful when you want to adjust the focus and exposure 
separately. So what does AEL stand for, you might ask? Well, clearly it stands for Appalachia Educational Laboratory. No, it doesn't. It stands for the Acceptable Exposure Limit. So this sets whether or not to perform the AEL, the Acceptable Exposure Limit, when the shutter button is half pressed, though kind of like the one previously with the focusing. And you can do auto, on, or off. So in this one, we've got E front curtain shutter. This just sets whether or not to use the electronic front curtain shutter function, which I believe you want to keep that on unless you're using some wonky lenses, some off-brand lenses, then that may be uh, something to turn off because it wouldn't even be uh, uh, able to be used. And this just speeds up your ability to fire uh, faster. So this function shortens the time lag between the shutter releases. So yeah, if it's on, it uses it. If it's off, it doesn't use it. So for instance, maybe when you shoot at a high shutter speed with a a large diameter lens attached, the ghosting of a blurred area may occur depending on the subject or shooting conditions. In this case, you'd want to turn that off. And then off-brand lenses may require that to be turned off. Then we've got uh, S Auto image extraction. Um, you can either think of this as superior auto, which I think is what it is, uh, or save. So save auto image extraction. So when shooting in the superior auto mode, the camera recognizes the scene to be shot with multiple images. This sets whether to extract an image automatically and save it. So with this dial set to superior auto, I believe you would be able to make that adjustment. So this just sets whether or not to save all the images that were shot continuously or just save the one appropriate image selected by the software. Then we've got exposure compensation uh, setting it. So this just sets whether or not to apply the exposure compensation value, the EV, to control both flash light and ambient light or just ambient light. And this signifies what order uh, you want your like HDR type bracketing to occur. So do you want it to be uh, neutral or what it deems to be a perfect exposure, then an underexposure and an overexposure? Or do you want it to be an under, neutral, and over? Then we've got the face, face registration. Uh, so you can register a face and then you can change the person to be given priority in the focus of the shot. If So if you register faces in advance, uh, the camera can detect the registered face as a priority uh, when this is set to on. And so you can register a total of eight faces and it's not perfect. So, I mean, if you had a hat or a mask, obviously, if you had a mask, um, if you had a hat, giant hat obscuring, uh, or if somehow your the face is being altered to the camera, I mean, then it's not going to work so well. And probably in dark places, it's not going to work so well. I mean, keep that in mind. So for order exchanging, um, the first face you register, it's going to be given priority, but you can change that order uh, with order exchanging. So then you've got autofocus micro adjustments. Um, so this is when you're using the LAEA2 or LAEA4 mount adapters, and that's sold separately. So that's going to be uh, using a device such as this, which will allow you to mount uh, different lenses. And then this also gives you the proper uh, lens contacts on the camera. And so this allows you to now put on a mount lenses providing full-time continuous phase detection autofocus. Um, it just gives you all those those benefits. And so what we're talking about is uh, roughly a $400 device here or a $300 device. And then we've got lens compensation. And then so... This is just compensating for the distortions and problems that might come with a lens. Uh, so this is just removing the darkened r ring on the edges on some lenses, potentially. Uh, chromatic aberration compensation. And then distortion compensation. And then these are the, the default settings. So when you start getting crazy with your lenses. Uh, you may want to turn these on or off. Um, and now we've got all of our um, customization of buttons and, and keys. And so this is actually something you might do once you get familiar with the camera and you'd be able to know where you want this stuff. And so I believe this button here, so like this movie button, which is located over here, um, by saying always, you're basically saying anytime you press this at all times, you automatically jump into movie mode when it's depressed. So let's just go through some of these settings real quick.
So you can see where it says uh, this is only active in the movie mode, whereas I've got it set to anytime I press that, we can automatically jump into movie mode. And now we've got a, a, our wireless connectivity here. And so you can set this to uh, send to a smartphone, to your computer, to, to view on the TV, uh, one touch, near field communication, airplane mode, and WPS. So here you can transfer images to be displayed on a smartphone. Uh, you need software or an application for your phone and you need to set that up on your camera as well and so send to a computer basically backs up images by transferring them to a computer connected to a network which you'll set up your wireless connectivity on this camera as well because then it can just transfer your your images off to your computer now i don't use this but is it going to transfer your videos i don't know so this kind of thing um, is very cool, but I, I like to take more control over it because I'll never know clearly what I shot and I just want everything transferred. And so perhaps there'd be a network error and then I'd only get half of my images over. And so then I'm messing with half of my images and then all of a sudden I realize there's more on the card and then that changes the way in which my project will go. And so that's why this isn't something I use personally, but I can see its value. And then we've got view on TV so you can view the images on a network enabled TV. Not just, you can't just pump it out to a TV. And then we've got the uh, one touch. So you, so this assigns an application to one touch. Uh, you can call up the application when shooting by touching an NFC enabled smartphone to the camera. Uh, airplane mode removes the wireless communications. So by turning that on, uh, your camera will proceed to turn into an airplane. No, just a kitty. You'll stop any wireless activity. And WPS just allows you to register with the access point uh, to the camera easily just by pressing the WPS button. And then this is just setting up kind of your network stuff. So these are something that's unique to the Sony camera. And uh, I'm not sure about their usability and function, but you know, there's a bunch of applications that you can use, which I'll be testing out to see if I like them. Some of them are free, some of them cost money. Um, you do have to go register on Sony's website site to use them but uh, you basically create an account if you haven't done so already and then we can select our camera which can basically narrow down what applications we can use and so uh, there's not a whole lot but some of these could be effective so we've got sky hdr we got time lapse which would be something interesting to potentially try um, we've got smart remote control we've got angle shift add-on um, sync to smartphone star trail multiple exposures motion shot looks like it might speed up any post-processing stuff multiple exposure sounds like it could be an interesting tool uh, we got uh, lens compensation we got bracket pro um we got light painting smooth reflection uh, stop motion this could be fun um which is just basically setting up uh probably just the settings on some of these um some of these you can do yourself if you know how to make the settings occur um there's another time lapse oh same one okay oh and then we've got a uh, this is interesting we've got a touchless shutter so you can activate the shutter probably through that viewfinder uh sensor so so we'll go ahead and uh we'll create an account here so if we go into the playback section here uh, we've got delete self-explanatory we've got view mode view files by date view the still images uh, viewing the videos the mp4 file format avc hds and xavcs's now moving over to the image index i'm going to select the format of images how many images per page 12 or 30 so display rotation is self-explanatory. Off always displays it in the landscape orientation. And we've got our slideshow option. So clearly you can choose the slideshow to repeat or the intervals. The intervals are one, three, five, 10, and 30 seconds. Uh, Rotate, self-explanatory. Enlarge image, self-explanatory. Uh, 4K still image playback, not peanut butter. Um, so basically you'll turn, this probably will work if you just connect it, but if you have having an issue, turn off the TV, turn off the camera, connect the cord, um, then turn on the TV to the proper input, turn on your camera, and you should see 4K images on a compatible 4K television. So if your television is not 4K, uh, obviously you can't see the 4K resolution. Uh, we've got uh, the witness protection plan. Now we've got uh, the image protection plan so basically you can lock folders um, any images with a date as far as being you can basically protect 
folders or anything within like a desired date from being accidentally erased. And a key icon is shown to denote that this has been turned on. Uh, we've got specify printing. Uh, so you can specify in advance on the memory card which still images you want to print out later. The DPOF, you'll see that a print order icon will appear on the specified images, uh, which stands for digital print order format. I don't think most people are going to use this because most people don't print their images out. And if they do, they don't do it themselves, generally speaking. And if they do, this function still probably is not going to be utilized very much. So we've got monitor brightness. Pretty self-explanatory. The display is going to get much brighter or the brightest it can be in sunny weather because that's when it's more difficult to uh, see screens that aren't like e-ink. And so in times like this, that's when it's nice to have an external monitor or that's when it's nice to actually use the viewfinder. Uh, or you could also put a covering over here so you can shade your screen. And I believe they sell these for other cameras. I'm not sure for this one. Uh, we've got uh, viewfinder brightness. So basically we're increasing the brightness of this monitor that's tucked in this little area here. We got the uh, viewfinder or finder color temperature. You can change it from warm to cool or cool to warm. Uh, we got the volume settings. I think that's pretty well understood. Audio signals. You can visually see your audio levels. So turning this on basically breaks out tiles. So it turns these tabs into uh, tiles with little pictures on them. Uh, these tabs are a little bit nicer. And this is when you click the menu screen. Basically, you can kind of go into a folder instead of uh, having tabs. I think the tabs are easier, straightforward. So mode dial guide is when you're changing the modes. Each time you go into a new mode, a picture with a little description is displayed. For tile menu, for tile menu, this is an example of what you would see when you hit the menu button. Yeah, so as you're changing your mode dial, this is the type of thing that you would see on this screen. By turning this to off, you no longer get this little informative screen and you don't need it. It's kind of nice because it tells you exactly what mode you're in, but you kind of know that because you selected it. When you use this mode dial, you get those different selections. So we've got delete confirmation. So when you want to delete a photo, you don't want to have highlighted delete because it's going to ask to confirm your selection. What you want to have highlighted is cancel in case you accidentally double tap uh, the button. You don't want to accidentally delete the image. So it's not a bad idea to accidentally cancel the deletion of an image. Um, so in order to delete an image, you have to first select it to delete it and then use the directional pad and then select to delete it. So that ensures that this is in fact something that you want to do. Power save start time. Self-explanatory. Cleaning mode. You're going to select this when you want to use the blower to clean your image sensor and just the surrounding area. So you turn off the camera, detach the lens, use the blower to clean the image sensor surface and the surrounding areas. Then you reattach the lens. And this can only be performed when the battery level is three or higher or when you're using an AC adapter. And so you want to be especially careful when you're cleaning your sensor because at that moment, your entire camera is very vulnerable to things that are basically microscopic. I mean, dust getting into the wrong places or or worse, some type of fluid because you can't just blow that off. We got demo mode, setting up a retail store. Might want to turn that on. We got remote control. Do you want to use a remote control or not? Yes or no? HDMI resolution. Uh, basically, auto is going to select the proper resolution to send out to the TV, or you can force a 1080p or a 1080i. Uh, this is going to be for if you connect your Sony camera to a Sony Bravia television and connect it with the sold separately HDMI cable, you'll be able to control the camera via the Bravia remote. And and on or off, HDMI info display basically says, do you want to display the shooting information onto the television or the display? Yes or no. So we've got USB connection. There's going to be uh, this auto setting, a mass storage setting or MTP setting or PC remote setting. The auto establishes a mass storage or MTP connection automatically, depending on the computer or other USB device connected. When you select this to mass storage, it establishes a mass storage 
storage connection between this camera and a computer so you can transfer files. Uh, setting it to MTP establishes an MTP connection, obviously, between the computer or other USB devices, and then their unique functions are enabled for use. And so PC Remote uses remote camera control software to control this product from the computer. So here's the icon to the software. So you first make the selection PC Remote, otherwise it's difficult to actually get the camera to do it. You have to first do that before you connect it to your computer, and then you run this software, remote control software, then we can select the camera, and now we can basically control the camera from our computer or our laptop, and the files are going to the desktop here. So start capturing immediately or start capturing after the specified delay. So maybe you're waiting for sunset, maybe you're waiting for something to occur. There's your capture settings, there's your capture interval. Minimum is 10 seconds, maximum is 180 minutes, and we can tell it to do how many total images? Up to 1,000, 2 to 1,000. Yep, so it's working pretty flawlessly here. And then we can select stop. Stop the interval, cancel. Yeah, so this is pretty cool. This, there's a lot of options we can do here. I wish they had a live viewing uh, here, right within this remote control camera setting. That would be actually pretty nice. So we have to physically change the mode dial to get the different settings to occur here. And that probably would explain why I told the camera to to record video. I'm actually not seeing any video being recorded. So I believe I have to actually select um, recording and then it will do that for me. It didn't do it that time either. So uh, maybe there's something I'm doing wrong. Maybe you can't record, but you definitely should be able to record via this remote control program. Anyways, pretty cool program. Nice to have in various situations. I would suggest installing it. It's simple. It's light. It's, it's not overly fancy. It's not overly graphically trying to be pretty. It's just kind of straight to the guts. Uh, if you're having trouble connecting, there's some suggestion that you want to set this to single. There's your languages, there's your date and time setup, there's your area setting, which is basically your time zone. So here's formatting. This is formatting the card. So if you don't like what you've shot, please select this. Also, this is a good idea if you don't have any images on there or if you've got images that you're willing to sacrifice. Formatting the card to the camera helps improve stability. So, you know, I know there's some issues with like my card and my GoPro and then so I have to format at it. Um, anyways, it just improves stability so there's no issues. I mean, you don't have to do it. If a problem arises that might point to the, the card itself, then a format's not a bad idea. So you can reset the file numbering. You know, when you do that, and if you copy all your images to the same folder, and then you reset, and then you start shooting more images, and you try to copy those new images to that old folder, it's going to have a lot of, do you want to copy and replace and all that stuff, because you got uh, two files with the same name. So I would suggest just going ahead and, and not resetting unless you have a need for it. So we've got select record folder. Basically, you can change the recording folder to which images are recorded. So this creates a new folder in the memory card. The new folder is created with a folder number one greater than the largest folder number currently used. Images are recorded in the newly created folder, a folder for still images and a folder for MP4 movies that have the same number are created at the same time. And when you insert a memory card that was used with other equipment in into this product and shoot images, a whole new folder may be automatically created. And then each folder can hold up to 4,000 images and then a new folder is created as well. And then you can change the naming convention of the folder. So you can use this standard form that they were using, this 100 msdcf or you can choose one that uses a date format. So I've not used this, but recover image database. So if your images were maybe processed on the computer and you were moving them to the memory card and then trying to view them through the camera, Camera. This does not fit a lot of people's workflows, but if there's a problem, then you can sit here and, and try to recover this image database. But you know, if you have a power issue during the database recovery, uh, you can actually lose your images or the database that points to the images. Don't think a lot of people will be using that function. Display media information. This just tells you how many images and how much movie time is able to be recorded to this memory card. So version, this is the version of the firmware of the camera body and the lens that's attached. So this is where you're going to check to see what lens versions you have or what firmware is on your camera body itself. These just reset the camera to default settings. So this setting reset, so camera settings reset, resets main shooting settings, and then initialize takes the entire camera back to when you first got it. So everything's reverted back to default settings. So I'll include in the description below kind of your help guide here, but this is the list of icons that you might see on this screen or other screens. So if you've got an icon on there that you just can't make sense of and you don't know how to get it off, you probably refer to this document or this video.
I'll put a link in the description below as well. 